Hey, Mommy Millionaires. I am so excited about today's special guest because I think this is like, I don't know, two years in the making or something like that. It's been a long time coming having the guest on today. So what I first want to remind you guys of is the Millionaire S Society is open for enrollment right now. So you guys are going to hear us talk about a lot of amazing concepts today. And what I want you to know is that you need mentorship to go to the next level. And the Millionaire S Society is helping you do that. I've coached thousands of women to get to where you want to go, which is making seven figures a year. So join that group. It's only $67 a month and I can't wait to see you in there. So let's get into today's episode. We are talking all things investing in yourself and investing in real estate. And I have the privilege of having my friend Steve Valentine on today's podcast. And me and him first met actually through Chris Harder's mastermind uh, two years ago, well back in 2018. And I was like, who is this guy getting up here talking about all things real estate with this goatee and like big attitude. And I was like, who is this guy? I need to be friends with him. And it turns out we're great friends now. And I love his heart and service for people. He is all about giving back and adding massive value to his community. And that's why I had to have him on the Mommy Millionaire podcast. He is a wealth of information when it comes to real estate. And so I cannot wait for you guys to learn from him. He's the owner of the Valentine Group that hangs out over in Arizona. And he's also a dad and a husband. So we're going to talk all those things today. So welcome, Steve Valentine, to the Mommy Millionaire Podcast. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. That was quite the introduction. It's all about the introduction. <laughs> I have to make sure like people are like, why should I listen to Steve? So hopefully now they know. Why now they, they know. Listen now they know. To Steve. <laughs> okay. So I know you weren't like, I mean, I know you kind of grew up in real estate. Not mm -hmm. kind of, you did. But like, it wasn't always like the glory story that you have right now. No, no, there's, there's a lot of mess in it when it comes down to so it. So I like to talk about the mess. Okay. So the mess, um, really it comes through living through so many different markets. You know, my dad always told me when, uh, before he passed was that in the 20 years I'd been in the business, I had seen just sheer chaos during that time from the upswing in the market to the downtick to it coming back. So I've seen it all. And uh, lived in it. My dad was in real estate back in the 70s and 80s when interest rates were super high, and he always got creative. That was one of the things, my legacies that my dad left me was the creativity in real estate. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lot of fun structuring things that, uh, that are creative, that aren't just the norm of putting a sign in the yard and selling and, and those types of things. So <clears throat> the mess kind of happened. 2006, um, had my license for six years at the time, and uh, the market crashed. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. um, at that time we were trying to build other businesses around. And if I could go back and do it differently, which we are now, um, we had seven construction companies, we had 75 employees, 22 fleet vehicles and real estate was supporting all of that. Uh. And so when it tanked, we were stuck with a lot of debt. So in 2007, um, we split the partnership with my parents and we walked away a million dollars in debt oh, and we had lost a million gosh. dollars. That literally just gave me chills. Like yeah, million dollars in debt. $400,000 personally guaranteed to American Express across eight companies. So how did that feel? Um, well, it came in the form of a suicide letter. That was pretty much the lowest point being a, a dad of toddlers feeling oh. like I had failed my wife and, um, not being able to provide. And so now it's, it's 2007 and we're on our own. We just lost our house to foreclosure. Like everything is in chaos. Oh and so, God. and your um, kids are toddlers at the time, toddlers at the time. And so I remember closing the front door on a house that, that my wife absolutely loved that we had over leveraged in order to reinvest into the company and keep things moving. And it was just one of those things that just never stopped. And so finally, when I just said enough is enough, we got to start over. And so, you know, and again, when you watch your wife after all the things that we had materialistic and, and all that stuff, and you watch her walk out the door in December to go wait tables at oh. 35 years old, leaving two toddlers at home, it just kind of breaks your heart and de defeated me Yeah. in a lot of ways. So how did you pick yourself back up? Because most people don't pick themselves back up. Yeah, there was a lot of people that didn't. Um, you know, we were blessed with an opportunity in 2008 
um, the broker that I was working with at the time. Um, this is back when we started seeing just a sheer amount of foreclosures happening, mm -hmm. right? It's like every house on the street oh, was yeah, in I some sort that. of foreclosure. Yeah. And so you'll, the only way you were really making money at that time was either you had investors that you were, you were building relationships. Um, there was a few people still able to, to buy houses in that time. And, uh, yeah, we but, did. That's when we bought our first home. Right. And so, so then there was the foreclosures, or in other words, the REO account. Mm -hmm. And so I remember the broker calling me that day and going, hey, I have an opportunity. Do you have $10,000? I'm like, yeah, I got ten grand." I didn't have didn't anything. Have I didn't have a pot to piss in. And so I just said yes. And, and it's one of those things I kind of learned back then, say yes, figure it out later. <laughs> and uh, so she's like, okay, I'm going to need that check and this, that, and the other. And so I ended up going to a really good friend of mine that had mentored me. And I got into this just small group of guys. We were having coffee when the market was shifting. And we were just talking about what can we do? What are we doing? And uh, a good friend of mine, Dave, lent me the $10,000 to, to start. Aww. And he was super gracious about it and dave actually ended up being my partner for a long time in that space but that was that was our opportunity of a lifetime because if you had that account that was that was where you're gonna make money now back then it was crazy you'd have to in comparison to now you have to send, sell 10 houses to make 10 grand because you're selling houses for twenty thousand dollars at the wow. time making a thousand dollar commission and so it was done in volume yeah and so by the time the reo days had stopped we had sold a little a little over 5,000 homes for Fannie wow. Mae and Freddie Mac. But it was it was scary, too, because we got the account in September of 2008 and had to have one more blow to go with my debt and everything else is uh, I broke my neck. How did you break your neck? Doing a Mad Mud run, doing an obstacle course, th Thanksgiving of that year. So three months oh, after we've been given the opportunity. Gosh. So that week, I literally hunkered down in the hospital with a neck brace on working nobody knows we didn't tell anybody because i told my wife i'm like if anybody knows it potentially could hurt this account like somebody will stop giving us assets yeah. so nobody knows and it was like before social media was huge right so it was i mean we couldn't even i just did an interview the other day and i couldn't even find a picture from that time in the you hospital there just there wasn't anything there and uh so i literally my assistant came into the hospital and my wife would go out and look at some properties. And then I had a couple other people that were helping me, but we literally like just hunkered down in the hospital. But that week it was multiple MRIs, multiple CAT scans, and I crushed C5, C6. Oh my gosh. So when I dove into the last obstacle, there was mud, water, something sticking out of the ground. And I hit it full force when I pushed off and it just crushed you C5, You got so C5. lucky. Yeah. Well, it was, it was by the grace of God. Cause the, the surgeon came in, he's like, yeah, two options. And this is my wife and I looking at each other Thanksgiving week saying, um, we can do this surgery. We're going to put seven pins in your neck, but there's a 50, 50 shot. You come out paralyzed. Oh my gosh. So we just had to have faith that, that God was going to be there and, and watch over it. And sure enough, I came out, I walked out of the hospital on Thanksgiving day walking and six weeks later, fully recovered, no physical therapy or anything. And still have my, my pins and reminder that the, six inch scar that's on my neck oh my gosh well i'm glad you're okay well thanks and i mean there's just so much that happened in that two year span yeah i mean it's crazy so do you think that all of that stuff that you went through has really led you to this moment that you're in right now it really has they were you know i always i always look at things and i think that sometimes god allows you to go through things before you need them mm. right you just never know where that impact is going to have later on down yeah. the road, right? Oh, yeah. So I remember writing or doing an interview for this article that was a, you know, they nominated agents every month. And I remember the year later, because in Phoenix, my parents and I, we were one of the largest, most successful real estate teams at the time. And when you go from that to being broke, how do you help other people that are going through the same situation? So they, they wrote an article and I decided to just let it all out. We'd gone through foreclosure. This is where we we're at. This is, you know. Because did you guys have to declare bankruptcy? We never did. Wow. We, how do you how do you go from being a million dollars in debt in debt? Like, how do you recover from that? We went nose nose of the grindstone. Um, we were everything that we were doing. It was almost like the Dave Ramsey thing. Yeah. There was a spreadsheet three pages long, and we just whittled away at it every month, 
Okay, if that doesn't give every single one of you guys listening in right now hope, then I don't know what will. That's so, insane. That's so amazing. So four years, so 2008 from the time I broke my neck and we got that, in 2012, we were actually able to, we had paid all of our debt off, all of our back taxes, and bought a, bought a house again four years later. <laughs> so zero to that was, was pretty amazing, but it was a character thing for us. Yeah. Because some of the stuff that was in that debt was personal debt to people. Mm -hmm. And I refused to file bankruptcy and I refused to not do, I mean, we settled with some debt with American Express and some of that other stuff and we worked through a lot of things with attorneys, but it was just a character thing. Yeah. I wanted to make sure that I had that trust that mm -hmm. somebody loaned me money and you wanted to make right on it. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And we did, we, we made right on everything there. And even some of that debt wasn't technically mine, but I was the mouthpiece behind the debt. It went into the companies. And I got stuck with it personally mm -hmm. because it was my mouth that made the agreement. Totally. And so I wanted to make sure and do the right thing. Wow. Well, that's amazing. Thank and you. here you are today. Here I am today. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So first of all, how does, how does like a marriage survive that type of like, cause that's almost like traumatic. It was extremely traumatic. Yeah. But I think marriage wise surviving it, it's having, Number one, my wife always looked at me and she never blamed me for anything. She's yeah. like, we made those decisions together. That's good. When we put the money in, when we signed for credit cards, all those things. And so <clears throat> when we went through it, it was hand in hand. We both grabbed shovels and we started digging. Yeah. And she was always, it, it's so interesting how she's played so many roles throughout the years. Like when the company was going down originally, she moved into the property manager role. And then she moved into, I'm going to be a transaction coordinator for my dad at the time when we had babies. And so she moved from one thing to the next. So she was, she never wanted to be that person that was just sitting at home. Yeah. She was always wanting to contribute. And so when we started doing the foreclosures, she all of a sudden became the accountant because if you, if you don't know this about foreclosures, you're bankrolling everything for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and getting reimbursed. Oh. And if you don't track it and you don't submit things the right way, you lose it. So now, you know, you go a couple of years into it and we have somewhat of two to $300,000 of our own money out there and reimbursable who better to track it. Yeah. <laughs> so Wendy's jumped in and she tracked it and she was amazing at it. And so it gave her a really good background we learned a lot in those days with construction and different things. And then, um, you know, where we're at now really is a result of my dad passing in 2015. Mm -hmm. um, he, you know, he was running a separate brokerage. He was a rock star when it came down to it. We both reinvented ourselves. You know, it's one thing I would say to the audience is don't be afraid to reinvent yourself. Yeah. So when I look, when I look in my industry, you know, I've been 20 years last year licensed and I can go through and it's like every five years, there's a market shift, there's something and you want to move with it. You want to, you want to find those niches and move with yeah. it. And so don't stay stuck in the same story. Right. So, so my dad reinvented himself while I was doing foreclosures. My dad was selling foreclosures at trustee sale to investors oh. and he was building these massive portfolios for people. I think my dad bought 900 homes at trustee sale in that four year period of time for investors helping them. And, uh, yeah. what was interesting is when, when he passed, it was, it was nine months. So in 2015, the foreclosures were slowing down. So I had to spend half of my week in my dad's company, breaking it down for him because he was diagnosed with terminal cancer and we didn't know how long it was going to be. And, mm -hmm. you know, he had so many irons in the fire that he wasn't mentally all there during that time okay. because of treatments and all that other yeah. stuff. Yeah. So that was really a time that, that my dad and I kind of got to heal some of our relationship in that nine months. Um, I used to do field trips on Thursday with my dad. I'd go mm -hmm. pick him up and take him to the casino and we'd hang out and we'd play bingo and all kinds of random stuff. But it was just my way of, of going and hanging out with him That's and making so the time cute. for it. Um, but as I started to break down his business, I started to see some things. I'm like, well, that might be able to be done a little bit better. Or maybe this. Or what is this? It was look like, like that fresh set of eyes. It was a fresh set of eyes. And so we all agreed that we would 
split his company and basically I would take over any investor relations with the investors on the sales and my mom would take over the property management company. She would keep that as a separate entity and that would provide an ongoing stream of income for, for that time period. Mm -hmm. And so that's when my eyes were really open. So this is probably the thing that still saddens me the most about my dad is that in that time, the 900 homes he purchased, he worked for all these investors, but he wasn't doing it for himself. Mm, he wasn't setting up that financial legacy. Correct. For it was, it was always about chasing the commission. Yeah. You know, it was, it was chasing the next payroll. It was chasing this. And some of the investors, I'll be honest with you, I, I didn't care for, they were extremely greedy. They were beating my dad down and I still, to this day, his biggest investor, I got no love for period. Um, because I really felt that they took advantage of my dad and some of the things that this man promised my dad, um, he completely reneged when my dad passed. So, you know, he took all of his properties out of the property management company and pretty much told my mom to go to hell. <gasps> and, <Aww>. uh, <clears throat> so what was, what was really disheartening for Karma. me, right? So at that time was when my eyes were opened up to, okay, I like the investment space and there's so much that can be done with it. Mm -hmm but I want to work with people and we're going to build wealth together and I'm going to earn a living for the knowledge that I have and my ability to be creative and my ability to move things around and guide you through the process. I try to explain to people when they come in, well, you get a paid a commission. Well, that's one part of it, but I'm also being paid for my knowledge and how I guide you through this. And so it's really become, you know, partly consulting, you know, showing, people how to invest and how to do it smart yeah not to just go buy houses because it's it's amazing to me that last year i spoke to about five thousand real estate agents and you ask people that are in the industry which reminded me a lot of my dad how many people in here own investment properties not a lot only five percent yeah so but here's the crazy thing a hundred percent of those people will sell an investor a house tomorrow but when you go out and buy a house for investment you were buying a business. If you're going to sell somebody a business, you should probably know a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. So that's where it's kind of, you know, again, full circle. The last five years, you know, you ask how, how my wife and I have survived. We went in different, different pieces of the business, but she found her niche and she found the thing that she loved, which now drives her. So in the last five years, we've, we've bought more than 500 homes. She acts as the general contractor. So she, Cause what's her, like her username or something? It's boss lady red. Oh, she changed it. Yeah. Wasn't it like contractor wife or something? Oh, that like was just kind of joking yeah. okay. that we had going on. <laughs> <clears throat> so, so she's flipped 500 homes That's in the last insane. five years and we've started to get a little bit away from the flipping because now she's a licensed general contractor and people are seeking her out for renovations and that's where she wants to go. She likes working with people and bringing houses back to life. And so again, we're going into this little bit of a reinvention period oh, where, yeah. where her business is starting to grow and, and she loves it and she's good at it and she's talented. And so we're focused more on the investment space and really being very creative inside the real estate space. Yeah. Okay. So what does that look like? in 2020 to be creative inside the real estate space? Oh, there's a lot of crazy to that. Let me... Because some people say, like, I have a brother-in-law that says, like, real estate's dying. Why? I don't know. He thinks that, like, there's no need for an agent anymore. Like, he's actually looking... <clears throat> for, sure. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to disagree yeah. with that. Like, you can. But most people will be like, well, I don't need an agent. You're right. You don't need an agent until crap hits the fan. Yeah, that's true. You know, it's, it's experiences. So if you look at my experience and I keep trying to figure out actually how to communicate it, I feel like the, uh, the farmer's, um, insurance commercial, um, you know, we've seen a thing or two or so we can cover a thing or two, whatever they say. Um, <laughs> I mean, I gave up TV, so I don't know. I mean, four weeks ago, I'm at a house like this, looking out the window and I watched a cow fall in their pool. What? <laughs> In Arizona? Uh -huh. You guys have cows in Arizona? We have cows in Arizona. Oh, wow. So <laughs> we've, something new every day. We have, I've seen so much. And so those experiences are what matters as far as guiding people through the real estate right. process. You don't need me to open the door, 
but you do need someone's experiences to guide you through when something goes wrong mm. or the negotiation piece or how to best handle financing or how to best, you know, move things around. And that's where a lot of our guidance comes in when it comes down to the investment side. Yeah. I mean, everybody gets into real estate thinking it's going to be easy. Totally. They're and like, there's so much money to be made in right. real estate. And it's not. You know, I was fortunate enough when I started with my dad, you know, mentorship is such a need in no matter what industry you get into. If you start out thinking you're going to do everything on your own, it's just not going to happen. You can, you can speed up your pace by having mentors and being willing to leave some things on the table in order to speed it up. Yep. You know, I sat at the two foot edge of my dad's desk for the first two years, no commissions being paid hourly go show a house, go put flyers here, go do this. But I listened to his phone calls for years so that I could learn what to say, what to do. And that was such an incredible experience for me. I didn't know mm -hmm. it at the time, mm -hmm. but now you talk to these agents that are just getting their license. I'm like, go mentor with somebody, go pay your dues and learn the business because you are, this will probably shock you is it's amazing that you can go to school for 90 hours and totally screw up somebody's life financially mm. because of your lack of experience. Yeah. You're helping somebody with the biggest investment of their life and you go do 90 hours and then you go practice on people. And it's just, it's a shame that it happens, but you hear the horror stories. Oh yeah. What happens? That's why people run. I always like, I'm like, Oh, I don't want the newbie. I don't want the newbie. Right. <laughs> but I think that that's, I mean, that but is, then you want to give those people a chance too. It's like, who's your mentor? Who have you been mentored by? Right. Yeah, I'm all about giving people chances, but there should be somebody mentoring them through yeah. those things. And, and I'll give you a great example. When you talk about, you know, the no need for real estate agents. Well, Wendy is currently renovating a house for somebody that she told them not to buy the house because they were going to be doing some remodeling. We go back and we look up the agent history. She had done like 25 deals in the last four years. Which is not a lot. It's not a lot, but here's the scary thing. Wendy told him not to buy it because there had been some additions on the house and it could cause issues with the permit process. Yeah. This agent had no idea when any of it is. So now Wendy's having to go backtrack because of permit issues. They've opened the house up. Now we've got problems with the city and some of this could have been avoided had they had somebody with the right experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I have this question that's coming up. Is right now a good time to buy like a home? Because I think I, I'm a huge Robert Kiyosaki fan. Hmm? And he's like, don't, your home is not an investment. Right. So let's, let's go on two ways. Cause Grant Cardone says the same thing, you know, rent, rent where you live and, and own what you yeah, rent. I rent right? my house. Right. Um, I own mine, but different price points. Right. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so here's the thing about that. It's always a good time to buy depending on what your future is when it comes down to it, okay. you know? So <clears throat> when you look at real estate investing, it is the only thing that you can borrow against with a low down payment and have somebody else pay off the investment over time, right? If you put $200,000 in the stock market, it's your 200,000 bucks, right? You can't go get a loan to put it in there. So it's something that you can leverage over time and have somebody else pay off. And so when you look at, I have crazy aspirations of my goal is 50, 50 at 50, which is 50 homes by the age of 50 that are free and clear producing 50 to $60,000 a month in residual income. Ooh, I like it. When are you going to be 50? I got nine years. Okay. All right. 40, 42 time. next month. You got some time. Yeah, I got some time. But we've, you know, in five years, so go back to this is how fast it can happen. And again, it's done creatively, and now we're guiding people on how to do it, especially in the entrepreneurial world. The people, they're, they're making money. Yeah, they, people listening right now, they want to know where to put their money. Right. So what happens, you know, five years ago when we start reinventing, I start looking, well, my dad really didn't know anything, so I need to make sure that I change. That you own. I, I change yeah. the course, yeah. right, for my family, for my kids. You know, would my mom's life look a lot different had my dad owned 50 properties yep. when he passed. And so we started diving into it and we bought our first house and another one of those deals, I walked into an appointment and I decided to ask the guy if I could buy it going, well, what's the worst case scenario? I don't make three grand and he tells me to get out, but what's the best case scenario? So in that five year period, 
We bought the house, I think, for 105. It's worth 250 today. Um, my mortgage is $700 a month, and it, it rents for 1400 a month. Wow, must be nice to live in Arizona. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you probably can't do the type of investing I do in California, but I can do it for you in Arizona. Yes. <laughs> um, so, and, and I work with a lot of out-of-state clients that are looking for a place that somewhere they can be trusted, mm -hmm. you know, with the investment. And we have all those things from construction to property management. So we really make it very turnkey and very easy for them to do it. Shameless plug. Right. Shameless plug. <laughs> um, but that's, but that's what happens. People are like, yeah, I want to invest in real estate. So they call a real estate agent that doesn't own a rental property and doesn't know anything about it. And then they sell them something that doesn't make sense. And then they get a bad gut about, or feeling about, oh, this in real estate investing sucks because of this. Actually it doesn't, but the person that guided you to you what you bought, yeah. you just had a bad experience. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a lot of people will have the question, well, what if the, what if the market goes down? What if it does? You know, that's, that's always a thing. That's everybody's, you know, what, what happens? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And but it's inevitable that it will, right? Well, it's inevitable, but it depends on the markets, depends on the industry. You look at where I'm at right now, we have the fastest growing County in the country. We have 250 people a day leaving here, going there. I wonder why. <laughs> um, but you're looking at all the factors in it. You know, some people I know that are investing in Alabama, there's no industry, getting mobile they're, homes they're there. getting, they're getting a really low baseline price, but there's nothing driving there. So that's going to be one of the first places that might see that fluctuation in market. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, point. you know, when you go back and you look at, well, what if it, what if the value of the house goes down? It doesn't make any difference until you're ready to sell it. And if you're really looking at it as a long term. I always go back to the very first house I bought. Had I kept it, you know, I was 23. I bought it for 107. I was 23 when I sold it. Sweet. The California investors are in here in droves. They're paying cash for everything. I sold it for 200 grand. I still don't know where that hundred thousand dollars is that I got when I was 23. <laughs> um, but so then the house in the downturn goes down to 140. So 30 grand over what I paid for it. But today, had I just kept it, my mortgage was nine hundred dollars a month. Um, it would be valued at two seventy five, and it would be twenty four years paid off. Wow! And it's a two hundred and seventy five thousand dollar asset that's almost free and clear, that is still producing. Wow, that's a good way to look at it. So it's it's a timing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have asked, well, the market's up. Why wouldn't you sell half your portfolio, and move it into the other half? Because that's that's not part of the plan. The plan is, is I want all these assets being paid off over time mm -hmm. rather than getting the cash flow. And everybody's got different opinions on how to do it. This is just my strategy. I, I like to hear all the different like ways that people are building wealth for themselves. Right. I think that's important. There's like more than one way to do something. Yeah. And there's, there's great ways. I mean, I, I was actually was super interesting um, reading an article the other day that Maricopa County was, is that where you're, that's where I'm okay. at in Phoenix. Um, we had, we were number 49 as far as the lowest amount of millennials buying houses in the country. Wow. Number 40, there's 50 states. 50 states. So we're, <laughs> yes, there's still 50 <laughs> states, Kayla. <laughs> um, but what was interesting about that is, is that I think millennials have gotten a lot of bad information because they saw their parents go through the real yeah. estate crash. They don't want to own all these other things. But what if the millennials were looking at it from a business perspective? You're going to go get some roommates and go pay somebody's rent, right? Yeah. So why not get a couple of people as partners and go buy a house mm -hmm. that eventually becomes an asset, yeah. right? It, it becomes a partnership. Well, you have to have that long-term mindset. Right. You but, can't look at like what's the short-term gain because right. be, then you are going to lose. Like. It's, it's, also, it's also a business mindset. Yep. Um, I still work out with one of my little brother's best friends from high school and I remember selling him and his best friend um, a house back when they were 20. They were both changing oil at an Econo Lube, and they bought a house together. And sure enough, they, they both got a decent payout when they sold it. But they were going to be roommates anyway. Yeah. So they just made it a business. I love that. So Great. it's just a just a different way to There's look at it. There's a lot of millennials listening in right now, so pay attention. Now, so... Let's say somebody lives in California, though. Mm -hmm. I think I, I have a lot of, well, I have people from all over the world sure. listening in.
But what if you're living in one of the most expensive places in the world, I think, to live, and you don't – like here, I was just talking to a girlfriend. Um, to buy a decent-sized home here where I live in Newport Beach, $2.8 million. Like, right. So you're looking at least at like $600,000 down. And most people don't have $600,000 laying around. Right. So what do you do in that case? Would you say, okay, I have, I might have $200,000. That's when I should just go and get an investment property in a different state and rent here? Yeah. Yeah, because you, you look at, you know, it depends too, you know, what you can. So I would always look at it from the factor of, okay, you can, you can buy a $2.8 million house. What's, what's the payment? What's the maintenance? All those things that go with mm -hmm. it, right? Mm -hmm. versus renting, you know, and I think if I'm in a $3 million price range, I'm probably going to see what the rent is for something like that. Yeah. Rather than investing in it because it's such a big purchase. Rent's going to be like 9,500. Right. So that versus the payment, it's probably cheaper to rent than it is to buy. Mm -hmm. And plus somebody else maintains it. So I don't disagree with that theory at all, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't take. So if you did have $600,000 to put down and you didn't, well, where are you putting that money? Yeah. It's at least good to spread it out and own some investment properties in different parts of the country or thinking about. But how do you do? OK, because I've heard different things about like only investing where like you can get there quick enough to like check out your properties. Or you have a trusted person that is taking care of those things. So what does the questionnaire look like? Like, how do you know you trust this person to take care of your property? You know what? I think a big thing is, is one, you're kind of interviewing the real estate agent and finding out what connections they have, what their background is, um, and then finding out some property management companies. And the, the reviews are all online pretty well in the property management companies. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's asking the questions, like, what do you guys do for preventive maintenance? And that's where I think a lot of property management companies um, – miss communicate with the client when people buy real estate you have to understand somebody's paying to live there but you still have to maintain the asset yeah right there's there's still going to be some money that has to be you don't want to be one of those landlords yeah my a, landlords like that <laughs> don't want to put any money into it yeah yeah and and We're so like, well this is a luxury home dude get over here <laughs> right so but that's a, that's a mindset so i try to communicate that to my clients when they come in that hey, you're going to get a return on your money on the investment by continuing to maintain and continuing to keep up the house. And here's where it comes back at. My average tenant on my homes is five to seven years wow. is how long they stay. Why? Because we put money into our homes. They're nice. They're upgraded. They're updated. And when something breaks, I fix it. Yeah. I'm not, I, I, they're people. They're human beings that are staying you in my homes. You want to take good care of them. Right. So I want to take care of the house and I want to take care of the family that lives there. I mm -hmm. don't want to be that person like what you just said where they're bad mouthing their landlord because they won't do anything. <laughs> right? Uh, um, hopefully my landlord's not listening in. He might be. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, so that's, that's really, you know, when you start investing into real estate, it's a mindset. And that's really where I take my clients down that road of what are your reserves? What do things look like? I don't want somebody. And these are such good questions. Yeah. You're like, duh. Right. <laughs> That's what I do. But I mean, I think a lot of people like they, it sounds like cool to do it, but like they don't know the right questions to ask. And like in order to have a better life, you have to ask yourself better questions. Right. Right. And so, so even for, you know, take you for instance, when it comes down to you're like, okay, so buying a house, I could, but it doesn't make sense. So I'm going to no, stay that, here. The house I want is like 25 million. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, same I'll thing. You should go rent that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but now you start looking at, well, where are some other places? Well, real estate is not a super sexy investment, right? But it is when you look at it long term. Long term. You have to have that long term play. Right. So it's something that's over here on the side that somebody's managing. Yes, you're going to have vacancies. Yes, you're going to have, I mean, like I said, I've, I've seen it all. Six months ago, I had the front door blown off of one of my houses by SWAT team. What? Yeah, they were serving a search warrant for the tenant. And it wasn't even the tenant. It was his buddy that was living there. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So what'd you do? Did you kick those people out? Yeah, he had to leave because we have a crime-free addendum. But here's the crazy thing. The guy had lived there for two years, always paid his rent on time. It had nothing to do with him. The house was immaculate. Well, it was just missing a front door. <laughs> so you just, you laugh about it. You're like, eh. Because it's not my problem. <laughs> but here's, here's where people always hear horror stories. It's like, 
you know, tenants are bad. They don't take care of things. Well, yeah, if, if you buy in lower income areas yeah. and those types of things. So again, it's strategy. What kind of landlord do you want to be? Are you trying to look at the long-term plan or are you looking at cash flow? So there's a number of different things that, that come into play that we question our investors. What direction do you want to go? So that we can give them all the information up front. So like right now we own 35 homes and we've only had one eviction in the last seven years. Wow. It was, it was the guy that got yeah. his right. door blown off. Right. Wow. And it wasn't even really his fault. Okay. So it's not that bad. It's not. We, you, you have repairs, you have things like, and, and here's kind of the misconception. So you think about, oh, well, if I have to replace an AC unit, yeah. well, AC units last about 20 years. So you're going to have to do it once. Yeah. Right. So when somebody calls and in reality, and, it's not that much money, right? If you're it, investing in real estate, you're going to have the cash to do that. Right. It's, it's going to happen yeah. or budget for it. Yeah. Right. So, Put it into so that's right. So that's where we try to, to help people. Now, when you get to 35 properties, you know, you have more outgo when it comes down to it. Yeah. Okay. So do you have somebody like managing all of that stuff for you have your own mm -hmm. property management yeah. company? And yep. so you're managing them. Yes. How does that, how do you keep track of those people? then your real estate group and then plus now you're consulting i know you're doing courses podcasts all that kind of stuff how are you doing all that good people you, you have to you, have, okay so how do you find good people that is such a hot topic on mommy millionaire oh, right now we could have that conversation all day long because it's taken me forever i was just telling chase i'm like i finally feel like my group is where solid. it needs to be it's solid the team is all in place do you think it's because you're finally where you need to be like um, you're attracting all the best people Yes and no. Part of it was I wasn't really clear on where I wanted to be. Ooh, and so yeah. if you can't communicate your vision and your clarity, it's really hard to bring in the right people. Yeah. And I also think that you have to, you know, have more of those almost like trial periods for people to see if they're going to fit culturally, to see if they're going to live out what you want them to live out. Yeah. So how long is your trial period for people? Um, 90 days. Oh, okay. That's what you said. So yeah, I like that. And like, how do you, how can you spot them out? Like what are some, or do you have some like trick questions to ask them before you even let them start their trial period? Yeah. So the, the trick questions are really in, I think it was some of the stuff I took from mastermind. Like what was the last three books you read? And they give you five. <laughs> yeah. Right. Then it's just like, like okay. you're, you, you're you have to have self growth, right? You have to have different, um, different things that they'll follow directions for different positions. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, you know, we just hired, I think it's really important, especially in real estate. I think it's important basically in any industry is somebody, the people that are there have to want to support your vision and where you want to go. And they don't want to be you. Oh my gosh. Yes. Right? That is so important. So important. Right. The, the person that's supporting you doesn't want to be you. They want to support you and take you yes. further. And that's their only goal. It's their mm -hmm. only drive. And I think that that's really important. We ask a lot of those questions because real estate agents, I mean, they're notorious for it. They come in, they're there for a year or two. They learn stuff and they're like, yes, oh, I can do I this on my own. It. Peace out. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's, we've had some of that turnover and it's super frustrating because you pour your heart and soul into people and teach them those things, but they have different aspirations and they can go do it better on their own. Yeah. So how are you creating an amazing culture right now? Um, amazing culture. One of the things that, that I love to do is uh, we have, it's our coaching on Friday morning. It's called butts and seats. So the joke is you got to be, you, would call it that. <laughs> you got to be there at 8am or if you're not, we all stand in the lobby and lock the door and laugh at you because oh. you're late. <laughs> um, I, uh, I always do it myself rather than having somebody else do it, but I go to Starbucks and get everybody's favorite drink on Friday morning. Oh, that's and, cool. And we do that. I need to do that. And uh, so it's just kind of my servant leadership, you yes. know, being grateful for them. Yes. Um, and then you it's... You guys take notes. <laughs> get them their favorite coffees. Yep. Um, that goes a long way. Actually, I just posted about it yesterday. I spend... Last Friday, I spent $120 on coffee. We talked about, I'm a dad, right? So I got teenage boys. Oh, so to and so at 6.30 after my workout on Friday morning, I go to Dutch with 
whatever teenagers they bring in. Dutch. Oh my gosh. I'm not a big fan of waiting in their lines. That's my problem. Yeah. <laughs> They're a time waste. Yeah. Um, but we so, don't have them here, so I think it's like got I it. love them. So I hang with 13 teenagers. Last week it was 13 of them, and it's my way of getting to connect with the teens. And I buy them all coffee, and they all get they all get hugs on their way to school. So I get 13 hugs from the kids, Aww. and um, it's it's a way that just kind of connects us. And then I go to Starbucks after that and get coffee for, for the team. team. Yep. Aww. That is so cool. Okay, so you're you're getting some quality time coaching them to be their best selves. Is that mm-hmm. what that looks like on Friday yep. morning? Yep. Okay, hold on. What do you need? Oh, no. Hi. <laughs> he went to hockey. <laughs> I'm almost done. 15 minutes. Bubba's at hockey. That's why Daddy went to hockey. I know. It's because Mommy had a long day. I love you. Okay, you're cute. Go shut that door. I love you. Thank you. Shut. I can see that you didn't shut it, dude. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, we're talking about company culture. Um, okay, we're talking about the coffee. And um, okay. <clears throat> Damn kids. Um, okay. Company culture. You did that with your team. Okay. What was going to be my next question? See, I should have bullet points. It's fine. Um, okay. I love that thing about your culture. Now I want to talk to you about like when it comes to helping those people on your team become their best self, how do you like you're growing wealth for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So I know you want to help your team grow wealth for themselves too. So do you like help them create their own portfolio? Oh, absolutely. So, okay. So that's, that's part of the coaching. On my, <clears throat> my goal is that all the agents in there are investors in investor mindset. So will you invest in them? Like, will you be like, Hey, here's money. So it's not money, but they get first opportunity oh. based on seniority. So we buy a lot of stuff off market. If it makes sense, they get first dibs on it. They know that the company has to make a certain amount of money if they keep something in house, which is fine, but I want them. You know, um, Erica's one of my partners. She just bought her second one. Um, Josh just brought one in where he has a goal. He doesn't have the down payment needed yet. So I partnered with him. So I'm going to partner with him on that property and we're going to do it together. Dude, I want to come work for you. Okay. <laughs> I'm joking. I don't think it's going to work for you. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very much a goal inside I is that I want that. everybody to understand and, and you know that kind of goes back to you know finding good people I think if you're going to go to work for somebody you have to look at it's not just a paycheck the non-monetary value you get from being somewhere yep. and that is one of the things I've tried to be very clear with my agents the coaching the information the stuff that you're seeing there's like, it's priceless information. You're not going to see it anywhere else. You know, the next real estate team you go on. It's like you're selling yourself to, to your teammates and mates right. all the time. Like, yeah, you're getting something special here. Right. And I think that's important. we, um, you're a good salesperson. Oh, thanks. <laughs> we, I chose a couple of years ago to run the real estate team a little bit different. You know, most real estate teams, they're kind of all off and running, doing their things. My team is there to support me. They, they're there to build Valentine group. They're there to help me build my business. And I like to refer to my staff as my partners. So when I'm dealing with a referral or something coming in, it's always my partner, Erica will take over from here. My partner, Josh, so they never feel like they're, oh, now I've got the assistant. Yeah. So it's, that's, that's one important. of the things that's really built our, our culture as well is that we win together as a group. It's not, oh, well, that person got that lead and they're going to make more money everybody's winning together. So I know there's a mommy millionaire listening in right now that is like, okay, I want to get started in investing and they've never invested in real estate first. How much money do they need to come up with? So typically it's 20% Okay. to put down is the typical non, what we call non owner occupied financing. So if you're going to buy a rental property, it's going to be non owner occupied financing. So the down payment always depends on cash flow. You know, the more money you put down, the more the monthly cash flow. Some people, um, they'll put as little as possible down 
because they're not concerned about monthly cash flow. You know, if it's break even or a little bit of cash flow, it's not a big deal. So it depends. Why would you not be concerned about cash flow? Because you want to, you want that home so you could have equity to pull out a line. Well, and, and again, this is my opinion when it comes down to it. (laughs) I have a portfolio that some cash flow very well, and some might be a little negative, but part of it is, is that the ones that might run a little negative, I bought a massive amount of value in the house. Okay. So there's, there's a, there's a lot of different levels to that. So I might have secured a house at 60 cents on the dollar and I'm paying 10% interest on it to hold it, but it's because the amount of equity that I bought in the deal. Okay. So this is why you need to work with somebody that's experienced. What if like Sasha from Wisconsin is listening in right now and she's like, you're all the way over in Arizona. How do they find somebody like you where they live? I think again, you can, I mean, Number one, you can always reach out to me and say, I'm thinking about investing in my market and I will find you a person that's in your market. Okay, you guys just got permission to hit Steve Valentine up, so uh, follow through on that. Yeah, I mean- Take it serious. He's a great mentor. That's that's the thing because it's not, again, even if you're in Wisconsin and you want to understand the investing, that's where my consulting piece comes in because it still applies in Wisconsin. Yeah, and you just don't want to go to just any like random real estate agent where they're just used to just selling houses. They're right. not looking at it as an investment. Yep. Once somebody calls and says, I want to buy a rental property or I want to invest in real estate, it becomes a sale for me. I've got things that I'm trying to build out and figuring out, okay, so what equity do you have in your house? Where are you at with yourself, with your IRAs? Like, it's, it's almost like financial consulting because yeah. I want to make sure somebody doesn't buy a house and they get in trouble. You know, I've yeah, seen too much of that. To right. Invest. Are you ready? Yeah. Are you ready to have an investor mindset? We get a lot of people that become accidental landlords. You know, they inherit a house and then they decide to put a tenant in it and then things don't go well because <laughs> they don't have the mindset. I and don't they know why I'm laughing. They weren't, they weren't prepared laughter. for it. <laughs> yeah. They weren't prepared for it. <laughs> okay. Um, so what if the person's listening in right now, they're like, okay, I don't have 20% to put down, but I want to create some cash flow. I want to get involved in this, like creating wealth. What would be your best tips for these women? Uh, the best tip. So it's a question I always get asked. Well, where do I start? Yeah. My CFO constantly tells me, she's like, can you please take it down to a third grade level for people that are not as crazy as you are? (laughs) Um, the best place to start is thinking about some of you, you younger people out there. You buy your first home, but you buy it as your first investment property. So, hey, I'm going to buy a smaller home. It's I don't have to put as much down. Mm -hmm. You know, when you buy owner occupied, you're putting 3% down. That's your easiest, cheapest way into real estate. If you're in a. So, could you buy something like a duplex? You could. You could buy a duplex. And then Um, you still only have to put 3% down? Yes. Oh, there you go. So I think that's the same advice Ben Anderson gave on a previous podcast. Yeah, I mean, it's it depends on the market you're in. Yeah. Right? So um, here, you, you may not be buying your first home here, right, with 3% down. But in Phoenix, let's say, and this is this is what I do with my first-time home buyers, I have, a, I have a meeting with them, and I say, look, we're going to buy a house, and it's going to be a house. You can make inside home for a couple of years, but after year one, we're going to have the conversation about where you're going next because you will keep this one and you can owner occupy jump. So you've got got that loan in place. Now you only need 3% to put down on the next one. So now you're taking this, you're prepared to be an investor and you're leaving the emotion out of it. And now you move to the next thing. So anybody so emotional about that. Yeah. Yeah. Their house is just a house. You can, you can make home anywhere. (laughs) Right. Um, that's the easiest way to get into it. So those of you that are like, uh, you know, the market's going to crash. Don't try to time the market. It's not going to happen. The question is, can you afford the payment? And can you live there for a couple of years and then rent it out? Mm. And now you're moving on to the next one. I love that advice, you guys. It's so amazing. So just to recap what you said, you want to make sure that you can actually afford to live into the house. Mm-hmm. And like, do you, do you like suggest what Dave Ramsey says, how you need to have six months? I say the same thing. I'm like, you need to have six months of living expenses put away. That's how you know you can afford it. Like what, how do you, how do you know? Right. Because what if like they, their job, what if they're in commission and like their stuff fluctuates? Yeah, you definitely should have some reserves. I mean, guaranteed. Um, 
I don't know about six months. I think everybody's different. You know, I, I think that if they're stable, some of them are two incomes. Um, I think it's just being stable. So I always, I always kind of refer back to my house when somebody asks, well, what happens if the market crashes? Well, I know I can go get a job at Starbucks and afford my mortgage, so I'm good. Okay. Right? So yeah. it's kind of that if crap hits the fan, can I still afford to live here? Yeah. You might not like be doing what you love to pay the right. bills, but you're, you're, right. you're exactly. paying the bills. Good point. Okay. And then look at it like from an investor's lens. Like you're going to be here for a short period and then you're moving on to the next thing. Right. So especially in the, the younger generation, even though they can afford it, right? And mm -hmm. this is some of the stuff I try to talk to people about. Great. You can afford a $400,000 house. Do you really need to go into a $400,000 house right now? Why don't you guys buy the first house as a rental property, live there, get used to those things. You don't have to buy your forever home right now, mm -hmm. but if you can do this jump, it feels like you need that forever home, right? <laughs> I well, remember being 21 and being like this, I need my dream home now. Right. Um, so you got to look at it from that standpoint of, you know, can I afford it? Should I do something smaller now and not take my budget to the max? Mm -hmm. Again, kind of being take the emotions out of it. Right. Yep. And so, so it's, it's always funny when parents are like, their kids are infants and they're buying this house. We're like, well, it's good schools. It's, I'm like, your you're kids aren't going to go to, you're not going to yeah, be here. Do Don't worry about it. <laughs> so I try to get people and I look at them like, will this be a good rental property in a good area down the road? Because I'm coming back and we're going to have this conversation because I want you to have, you know, think about it. If, if you're in your thirties and the next six years, you're able to acquire five or six homes by going from one point to the next, even doing some of the fix up stuff. You know, some people like to do the DIY projects and those types of things. I'm not very good at it. In fact, my wife told me the other day, she's like, you're not allowed to touch the tools. <laughs> like I'm not a man's man when it comes down to tools. Um, so <clears throat> there's a way to build equity and do those things. And so will your, 50 year old self thank your 30 year old self for making those decisions oh that is a good question will your 50 year old self thank your 30 year old self for making those decisions right. <gasps> write that down you guys yeah it's it's important because mm -hmm. you don't want to look back right because everybody always like thinks just short term well it's also are you you know it's like my dad if i look back would my dad have regrets about the things that he didn't do you know, when he was on his deathbed, mm -hmm. was there things that he wished his 30 year old self would have done yeah. to set him up for more success, yeah. not better success, but more success yeah. in, in his legacy. Mm -hmm. so it's unfortunate that sometimes those are the things that have to happen to mold us into uh -huh. asking ourselves yeah. better questions. Yeah. Right. And so for all of you guys listening in right now, I think it's like, don't wait for a moment like that to have to ask yourself a better question. Right. You know, how can I build wealth for myself now? Yep. Okay. It's so good. Um, what's the most shameless thing you've done to build the Valentine group? The most shameless thing I did was walking into my dad's office in 2007 and being the man of my family. Cause I'd always been a partner with them. That's, you know, I was always around my parents and looking him in the eye and telling him that Wendy and I are out mm. and severing you know, the family business and having to go do it for myself because my dad and I were not seeing eye to eye as partners and some of the stuff was going to go really bad. And I just had to make that decision. And it was, it was the hardest decision I ever made in my life, mm -hmm. but it was something that I had to sever myself from my parents for two reasons. One, eventually, hopefully it would heal the relationship, but I had to go take care of my wife and my kids. And that was what was most important. Mm. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm proud of you for doing that. Thank you. And I think a lot of times people like live by illogical rules. Like some people would say like, oh my gosh, I can't ever do that to my dad. I have to like stick by my dad's side, you know, for better or for worse. Even if it means like me losing my wife over it. Right. You know, and you had the guts to say, no, like I'm not going to live by that illogical rule. I'm going to make up my own rules for my family right. now for the new Valentine group. For the new Valentine group. Right. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's awesome. Okay. Where can everybody find you, Steve? So I'm on Instagram, Steve D Valentine and, um, website is Steve D Valentine.com. All right. Do, do you not have a podcast anymore? Um, it's being relaunched. It's being rebranded and relaunched. Okay. 
Okay, cool. Well, I am so glad that everybody listened in today. I think I learned a lot from you, had a fun conversation. So I want to make sure everybody follows you, Steve. And I want you guys to stay tuned for the recap. Thank you. It was fun. Oh my gosh, that was such an amazing podcast with Steve Valentine, you guys. I learned so much, not only about like, you know, when to invest in real estate and why, but the team culture. I'm going to start buying everybody coffees at my house on Fridays, okay? And all the kids. I don't know. Maybe it's too soon for the coffee, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll do, we'll do um, vanilla steamers instead. But the main thing I'm taking away is I really, really, really want to push all of you guys to get started in investing before you think you're ready. And the way that you know you're ready is by having a great conversation with somebody you trust, somebody that has had the experience necessary to guide you in the right way. And that's why I'm a huge fan of being a coach and having a coach because it keeps you from making the same mistakes over and over again and it helps you save a lot of your money and build your wealth quicker. So make sure to write down, re-listen to Steve's podcast. I mean, re-listen to Steve's episode and make sure to follow him because I know I follow him. He puts out a ton of great information all the time. He's always like cracking jokes on his employees and making life good. So he's a fun person to follow. I can't wait for you guys to have Steve in your life.